church across all of our sites, right? Woo! Even here at the Surrey site, we record this. Welcome at all of our sites, though. Welcome online. Uh, good to have you, part of Village Church. My name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, I am in charge of kind of overseeing this whole thing and all these crazy staff and all these great volunteers and people who are part of our church and also preaching and teaching uh, the Bible to you, which is my great honor and privilege. And uh, it is awesome to be with you. We are in the second week of a series that we are calling The Nine Keys to Happiness. And so... Uh, uh, we talked last week, we, we rolled out the first one, and uh, it comes from a passage in uh, Galatians, which is a book the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that was full of division, and he, not that, you know, we have any of that today, uh, but... Uh, there was a letter that he gave and he said, how are we going to actually function in life? How are you going to find ultimate happiness in your life? And of course, that's the ultimate question. And today's uh, topic is actually kind of what this whole series is about in a sense, because uh, the basic idea is that all of us in our lives, the ultimate thing we're all looking for is happiness. The ultimate thing we're all looking for is joy. Uh, that's the thing that drives every decision we actually make. Psychologists, philosophers, even science is now telling us that our own happiness is the reason we do what we do. It's, it's the reason we chose the spouse that we chose. It's the reason that we wear what we wear, eat what we eat. Everything we do in life tends to be about our own happiness, our own pleasure, our own joy, feeling good. Last night um, uh, in the afternoon, it started in the afternoon, some, some uh, neighbors said, why don't we come over? We'll hang out together. We'll just chill for an hour or so, whatever. So they, I think they came over about 4.30 in the afternoon to my backyard. They didn't leave until 11, all right? So if I have bags under my eyes, <laughs> that's why. Now, what is that about? We're all sitting there telling stories, laughing, joking around, having fun. What is all that about? Ultimately, it's about our pleasure. It's about our joy. It's about having fun. That is literally why we schedule the day that we do. It's the reason why we do everything we do. Our own joy, our own pleasure, our own happiness. And the reality is that's what creates addictions in life too. And so if you look at people who are addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or, or shopping, what are they trying to do? They're trying to stimulate their mind. They're trying to make themselves feel good and they get caught in that and they start to be, uh, look at that thing that they're addicted to as the way they're gonna feel joy, the way they're gonna feel happiness in life. And what this series is about, it's about the fact that none of those things will actually work. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, before he starts the list of the nine keys to happiness in your life, he tells us, here's the way to derail your life. This is the way, you, sexual promiscuity, hatred, fear, uh, all these things that will actually derail your life. And then he says, but here's actually how you're gonna have fruit in your life and flourish in your life, and he starts the list. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit though, the Holy Spirit of God, the one who's gonna bring happiness and joy in your life is this. And he starts, like last week, love. And the second one is the one we're talking about today, which is joy. Lo he starts with love and he moves to joy. Now, if you are new to Christianity or you're exploring Christianity, we're glad you're here. And if you're new to the whole church world, you might actually go, how could joy be something that Christianity is all about? Because the Christians I know certainly don't uh, <laughs> represent joy in their life, right? And so you might go, um, okay, if you were to say, what is Christianity all about? I might say it's about truth, or I might say it's about morality, or I might say it's about going to church, or I might say it's about being a good person in the world. But the idea of joy doesn't seem to be the thing that we think about when we think about what's the point of Christianity. And yet, Jesus actually offers this. He says, I have the answer, listen, I have the answer to the deepest longing of humankind. I have it. And this is why the Psalms talk about the idea that where God leads us in our life is delight forevermore. That's where all this is going. Your own pleasure, your own delight 
is what the gospel actually answers. Now, our culture comes along and goes, no, 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 we have the ultimate answer to your happiness. Every advertisement is trying to sell you on a narrative about what will make you happy, right? If you have a nice body, that's what's gonna make you happy. If you have a good sex life, that's what's gonna make you happy. If you buy this shiny car, that's what's gonna make you happy. More money, more success, more power, better reputation, great family, great kids. These things will make you happy in life. And here's the problem. None of those ever work, right? None of those work, man. Like we try them. And the problem is this, they always end up failing us, right? Like I, I do a lot of uh, premarital counseling with couples who are gonna get married. And I remember sitting with one couple a couple years ago and I'm like, okay, just so we get some expectations, uh, how many times are you guys gonna have sex per week? And the guy, without even flinching, just goes, we're gonna have sex 13 times a week. And I said, how'd you get that? He goes, well, twice a day and once on Sunday. <laughs> which is like, it's Sabbath, so we're resting or whatever. So it's like, all right, it's like, uh, okay. But, but that kind of doesn't happen, all right? We know that like most people who are married in any of our sites are like, ah, you just laugh, you know, intuitively because you know that ain't happening because people actually end up letting you down and life doesn't work out the way that you expect it to. And so when we trust to these things, they actually let us down. And so Christianity comes along and it says, I have a secret for you. It's not life fulfillment that's going to make you have happiness in your life. It's soul fulfillment, right? It's not circumstances that are going to create happiness and joy. This driving force of your life that you have every single day None of that stuff is going to solve it for you. And you know it because you've got those things and they, you still wake up unsatisfied ultimately in life because it's not about life fulfillment. It's about soul fulfillment. And Christianity comes along and it says, I've actually got the answer to that. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, I sometimes wonder if all the pleasures of this world are just not substitutes for joy that we're trying to get joy from them. So some of you are like, okay, but there's no way Christianity actually cares about this. I can see Christianity caring about the Bible or morality or rules, but not joy. So let me unpack for you a bunch of Bible passages. There could literally be hundreds of them that I go through to show you that the Bible actually cares almost, and I know this sounds crazy, as its top priority about your joy and your happiness. So let me just run through a bunch of them, right? Uh, Luke chapter two, verse 10, the Christmas story. And some of you who might be new to church, maybe you've shown up to Christmas services and you've kind of heard the story or you've watched the Charlie Brown, you know, Christmas. And it's like, okay, uh, the angel said to them, meaning the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great what? Joy for all the people, right off the bat. The first sermon angels preach to shepherds in a field is the reason Jesus Christ is coming. Ain't for truth, ain't for you know power, ain't because it's joy. He wants to create joy in your life. And the biggest person who fights him on it is who? You, you idiot. <laughs> Some of you are like, what? Welcome to Village Church, right? <laughs> you think you know better than him. So you wrestle stuff away from him and they're preaching going, don't you know Jesus came to bring you great joy for all the people? And then he says this, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 13. Here's, a, here's another example, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven, this is an entire chapter in the book of Matthew based on parables. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he's constantly saying, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like, is like, is like. And one of them, he says, it's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered it up. Then, listen to this, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That when you find Jesus as a treasure, you're willing to sell everything you've got in order to get him. And the driving motive is what? Joy. He, in joy, he sold all that he had 
and bought the field. That's the motivation. I want to, I want, my whole argument to you today is God has as his ultimate idea of what he's trying to get in your life is your joy. Now, sometimes we try to say, no, no, no. I think joy is lots of money and nice car and nice family. And he keeps going, guys, you got to stop with that because that stuff will ruin you. You can't base your life on that. We'll talk about that. John 15, Jesus says this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Psalm four, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and their wine abound. It's like a critique on the way we live our life, guys. All we want is more grain and wine. Some of you, could, you, you build your life around, how do I get abounding in grain and wine? Abounding in grain and wine. How do I get nice stuff? And he goes, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when they have all that stuff. Proverbs 10, the hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Romans 15, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. See, the philosophers, Aristotle, Aquinas, they would talk about the idea that we were made for beauty. And they would say, when you see beauty in the world, you begin to long for God. I think it's true about joy. I think when you see joy in the world, you long for God. We were actually made for joy. John 16, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Romans 14, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Literally, I could just keep going, but we never pitch Christianity like this. We never sit our friends down and go, here's why I want you to believe in Jesus. It's not so that you can go to heaven when you die. It's, like, it's for your joy. And of course, going to heaven when you die is a part of that. But let me have a conversation about your pleasure, about your delight. Don't you think more people might listen to us if we were like, I'm going to tell you about your own happiness, pleasure, delight, and I'm going to give you the solution to it. Don't you think they might go, this is actually really interesting versus I'm going to tell you how to not go to hell and I got 10 minutes. Like, who's going to get jacked about that? But you show someone, I'm going to fight for your happiness right now. Your ultimate. Yes, in this life, but I'm talking about for the 80 billion years when this life's over. Delight forevermore. Now, some of you are like, man, okay, conceptually, it's in the Bible, but I know a lot of Christians, and uh, they are not people defined by joy, right? Like the people on social media who are Christians ain't seem to be defined by joy. And when I'm hanging out with Christians, these tend not to be the people defined by joy. The, I follow a, a Twitter account called the Church Curmudgeon. <laughs> and it's just like some face of a guy. He's like, right? It's like that guy. Like that tends to be how we think about Christianity. And when I first started going to church, I was like uh, 18 years old. I walk into church and of course I don't know anything. I didn't grow up in church. So I'm like sitting in the, in the back chairs. I literally walked into a night service and I had this like full thing of pizza and a pop. And like everyone's sitting there all formal and they're like suits. It's like a Baptist church. The orange carpet smells like mothballs. And I'm like walk in there and I sit down with my, I got my folded pizza and I'm cracking a Coke. I'm like, ah, I'm just watching the show. And some guy was like, you can't eat pizza in here. This is a sanctuary. I'm like, what the heck's a sanctuary, bro? Get out. And then I'm smoking outside and I thought I was smoking like in front of some random window and it turns out it's the senior pastor's office and the worship team's there and they're about to go lead worship and, they're, and I'm sitting there and they're like, bro, we're praying for you. You're a disaster. And then one day they had the pulpit up there and the sanctuary was, no one's in it. So I walked up behind the pulpit and I started preaching. I said, I'm like, I don't know, I'm doing some Pacino speech from Sense of a Woman or something up there. But I'm like, I'm like preaching. And the guy comes in, get off that pulpit. That's a sacred pulpit. Get out of here. Like church curmudgeon, right? Like that's how a lot of you sound in life to the world. 
We sound like we're just all about stuff we're against. And yet here's Jesus. He would be going, that is sad if the world knows Christianity for anything but your joy, y'all. It's sad. Because sometimes we picture Jesus, like think of the movies where we, we show Jesus, like he's always so serious. He never has any fun. But Jesus was a joker. He had fun. He made fun of these guys. He did crazy stuff. He was, you never, you always picture like when you watch the movies, Jesus is like a robot. Loveth thy enemies. Prayeth for those who persecute you. Now we shall pray. Our heavenly fathereth who arteth in heaven and halloweth. It's like, ah! He was a joker. Like picture Jesus smiling, having fun because he's bringing the kingdom of God to the world. He's defeating Satan, sin, and death. He's jacked up. Hebrews 12 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he was jacked up. And some of you do not look very happy in life. So I'm telling you, as a Christian, joy shall define your life from this day forward. Has to, because the world's gonna be drawn to that joy. It's gonna be drawn to people who are like, okay, and, and, and here's the interesting thing. So I'm telling you, this is the reason to become a Christian. I'm telling you not, not to go to heaven when you die. No, I'm telling you for your own joy. And some of you might be like, well, because I think Christianity might, might not be about anything other than this. And some of you are like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Listen to uh, hundreds of years ago, there's uh, something called the Westminster Catechism, which basically taught people how to think about <clears throat> Christian ideas. It would ask theological questions and then you would do answers and they would memorize it and they'd take you through classes. And from your very young, you would memorize these answers and it was teaching theology. So here's what, how the Westminster Catechism starts. What is the, this is the first question in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Okay, so what is the chief end of people? Not just men. People, what is the chief end of all humankind? What's the point of why we're here? The answer is this, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The word joy is in the thing as the chief purpose of your life. Now here's the problem. We hang out with Christians so long that we begin to feel like life is supposed to be about just dragging ourselves around and we're sacrificing for Jesus and I'm dragging around and I'm kind of miserable, but that's okay because I follow the man of sorrows. <laughs> and the problem with that is, is that then anything you take joy in in life is ruined by that mentality because the fact that you took joy in it, check this psychology out, you begin to think that it's wrong because you took joy in it. Uh, one writer, uh, John Piper wrote a book years ago, and I love the subtitle. The, 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 the book's called Desiring God, and the subtitle is Reflections of a Christian Hedonist. And you know, the definition of hedonism is it's someone who just does stuff for their own pleasure. They go after stuff for their own joy. Picture like, you know, spring break in Florida, right? <laughs> like, right, hey, hedons. Like, look at those hedons on the beach. Like, you know? And so, Piper got pushed back. They're like, how could there be Christian hedonism? It's because the impulse of my soul is to go after the thing that gives me the greatest pleasure and joy in this life and the next, and there's no greater answer than Jesus Christ himself. That's what Piper's whole point is. We all need to live our life as Christian hedonists, realizing that Jesus is actually the answer to the ultimate question in the upper room. Jesus spends his last night having a meal, talking to his disciples in the Gospel of John. Starting in chapter 13, it goes for a few chapters. But he's going to be arrested and murdered and killed. And up to that point, John has only used the word joy twice in his Gospel. In those chapters alone, he uses it seven times. Joy starts to heat up. Check this out. As Jesus starts to move closer to the cross and closer to his suffering. Why? Because there is no greater joy than the forgiveness of sins. 
the thing he's about to accomplish for the world, now he starts talking about joy. Now, in the midst of it, he's not just talking about happiness in this, the way that we use the word, because in the midst of those conversations, he's actually talking about their suffering and their persecution. He's actually saying, you're going to suffer and die just like I am, but he's talking about joy at the same time. It's, it's, it's like he's talking about a deeper joy than you and I could ever understand, a serious joy that like doesn't come about through our circumstances in life, it comes about by something more fundamental that's been fulfilled in us. It's like when I was 17 years old, listen, I was having a lot of fun in life. I wasn't a Christian. I was having a lot of fun. I had friends. I was doing something, all the stuff. You, yeah, 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 great. Life's fun. Life's joy. It's great. But then when I met Jesus, I found the source of that happiness. I found the source of joy. And then that, then my happiness, my joy, my energy went up 10%. Went up 10 times because it was like, oh my gosh, I've actually found. So C.S. Lewis years ago, he, he put it this way in one of his most famous sermons. Uh, it's a sermon, you should go read it. It takes you probably half an hour to read it, shorter than my sermons. Um, it's, it's a sermon called The Weight of Glory, okay? And in it, he says this. Most people, and now think about this with yourself. He says, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There's something in you that nothing in this world can satisfy, which ends up telling you you were made for a different world. You were made for a different kind of source of this joy. And then he says this, there are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. I'm not now speaking of what would be ordinarily called unsuccessful marriages or holidays or careers. I'm speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we grasped at in that first moment of longing, which just fades away in the reality. The spouse may be a good spouse and the hotels and scenery may have been excellent and it may have turned out to be a great job, but something has evaded us. And then he says this, it's like we have a lifelong nostalgia, a longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off. We long to be on the inside of some door, which we've always seen from the outside. This is no mere neurotic fantasy, but the truest index of our situation. And Jesus is the solution to that separation, that thing we feel cut off from. Every morning when you get up and you have a longing to be satisfied and to be more happy than you are now, you gotta understand the answer to that plight is Jesus. That's the point of the gospel. Uh, in um, Philippians chapter four, so Philippians have been called uh, the epistle of joy, uh, which is kind of crazy because Paul, when he writes it, is where? He's in jail, barely getting any food, getting beaten on, behind bars, has nothing, is totally poor, suffering, in pain, and he writes a letter that has a ton of concepts about joy. Make sure, and he writes these words. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 4. You, if you've been to church ever, you've probably heard them. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. It's like, I, I remember when I was at summer camp when I was nine, they had that song, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice, rejoice. Get that out of your head. So, so, but, but I would always wrestle with that because it's like, wait a minute. In, life sucks sometimes. So how do you rejoice in the Lord always? What is that? What do you mean always? You mean when I can't pay the bills? Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice. Hey, you have a cancer diagnosis. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say 
I remember um, I was sitting at my office before uh, Aaron was pregnant. She was nine months pregnant with our first daughter. And uh, I got a phone call. Hey, uh, I've been hit by a car. I was walking across the street. A car rammed into my stomach. I don't know if the baby's dead. I don't know what's going on. And I'm like on the phone going, how, how does that happen, first off? Who gets hit by a car anyway, walking across the road? Uh, when they're pregnant, you'd think you'd be like, hey, let's be careful in the middle of the day in Ladner. Anyways, uh, didn't say any of that stuff because I'm a good husband. Because uh, I'm thinking if you're pregnant, you should have bubble wrap around you. You're nine months pregnant. Like, let's just put everybody in a room, bubble wrap them. <sighs> so anyways, so I'm driving to her to find out whether my baby's still alive. You think I'm in the car going, rejoice in the Lord always again, I say rejoice. No, I'm like, this sucks. I'm terrified my baby's not going to have a heartbeat. See, this is a kind of joy that has to transcend circumstances. He's in prison, he's beaten, he has no food, and he says rejoice in the Lord always. It's not feel happy. It's, uh, he doesn't want you to deny reality. See, some Christian teachings and even Buddhism or New Age philosophy, it says the way you're going to rejoice always is to deny reality, that reality and suffering is what um, some religions call maya. It's, It's an illusion. And all you need to do is act like that state of reality doesn't exist, and then you can move on and rejoice. I was talking to someone... Uh, the other day, and they said, you know, during COVID, during this difficult time, I was in my house, I was super stressed about everything going on in the world, and so I would just watch funny television shows. I would never turn on, like, a drama, because I had enough drama going on in the world, so I'd just watch funny shows, and I'd laugh, and I'd go, hee, everything's fine in the world. But that's to deny reality, and that's not what Christianity asks you to do, not to deny, to recognize it, but to understand that your joy is going to come from a, a different place a deeper soul set, a posture of life. See, the answer is in verse five. It's the next verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How? In the midst of terrible circumstances, he says this. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So he's saying the reason you can go on and be joyous is because your life is seen as under and overseen by a good God. Because if you're an atheist, if you're an agnostic, if you don't believe in God, then all you've got is those circumstances. Of course, life is going to steal your joy. It's going to steal your happiness at every point of contact with suffering at all. But Paul's going, no, no, no. If you've got a fundamental shift where your identity is not in those things, then you can transcend when the world tries to... Like I was at this um, garden party. We were raising money uh, last weekend. uh, And... Uh, this guy stands up and he's like, uh, he's giving a story about something. And there's like 200 people at this thing. And he's giving some story about his childhood. And then he stops and he pivots and he goes, you know, unlike Mark Clark's sermon illustrations, this story does have a point. <laughs> and, buddy, two, and, and now I'm sitting there thinking, oh, no one really thinks that. So I'm the only one who finds this funny. 200 people, bah! Like laugh at me, like. (laughs) There's people in life that try to steal your joy. They just embarrass you in front of people, make fun of you, talk behind your back, gossip. This guy's membership's been revoked already. I didn't went home, I didn't delete. There's people who try to, I'm joking, all right? He's perfectly fine. There's people in life, there's circumstances in life where if you do not have your identity like firm in Jesus, then they're going to destroy you. You're gonna care what people think. You're gonna care, that circumstance is gonna rob you of the very joy that Jesus is giving you. See, if your joy is from your marriage, What happens when that marriage dissolves or your spouse dies? If you get all of your joy and happiness from your spouse, from your husband. I remember watching my mom um, 10 or 11 years ago go through the death of my stepdad, who was an awesome, awesome guy, awesome man. And uh, I remember sitting at the, uh, we we had had the funeral and he went down into the ground. And 
I remember we were the last ones there, and I'm standing with my mom, and she's just sobbing, and she's looking into this hole in the ground, where, and she's like, I don't want to leave him. It's so cold. It's so cold. I'm like, man, if we derive all of our happiness and joy, man, who's going to save you when you're dying of a broken heart? If you get all of your joy from your body and how fit it is and how great it is and how healthy you are, what happens when all that goes away and that diagnosis happens? Or you just start to get older and, and things start falling apart a little bit. But all your happiness was there. And now it's being challenged. And what are you going to do if your kids grow up and one day they leave, hopefully, and get back to my life. <laughs> if all of your joy and your identity comes from being a parent, then it's gone. And you're left sitting there with your spouse going, I don't even know you. And I don't know how to have happiness and joy in my life because I got it from this interaction every day where I taught you something and you loved me and you hugged me and I put you to bed and you kissed me and all of that is where I extracted my meaning and my purpose and my joy and now it's gone. And I'm lost in the world. It's interesting when we think about joy because it doesn't always happen Paul's saying in Ephesians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, even though I'm in prison, I might die any day, just from happy circumstances. Um, my wife was on a mission trip to Uganda last a couple years ago. Uh, she just came back as the pandemic started, March 2020. And when she was in the airport on her way home, she looks over and she sees this baby. And it's, it's attached to its mom. And the mom isn't paying attention. So she's just kind of sitting there. She doesn't speak English, but the baby's kind of hung like this. And my wife can see it's starting to turn blue. And, and Aaron just looks and she just darts across the airport, grabs the, and the woman's like, what's going on? She takes the woman up and she takes the baby out and just starts literally like doing little, and, and someone's like, she's coming to call. And then paramedics took like two, three minutes to get there. And, and this baby revived and it was okay. And in that moment, what happened? The airport broke out in celebration. Right? It's like the mom was crying and happy and joyous and laughing and everyone around is clapping. Why? Because it's not always just in happy scenarios. Sometimes the great happiness comes out of going through the fire. Sometimes the great happiness comes from circumstances you never would have asked for. And that's why he says you can rejoice in the Lord always because God is the one who's in control. He says, the Lord is at hand. He's still moving. He's still working, even in the midst of the difficulty that you will inevitably face in your life. And some of you are like, I do not face any problems in my life. Just wait. <laughs> they will be there. My buddy Judd Wilhite, who's a pastor in Vegas, that is a thing. It's amazing. It's this huge church in Las Vegas. Uh, 10, 15,000 people in Vegas. And uh, he says this as he preaches to them all the time as they try to find their joy in the lights and the, and the, and the, and the, and the sparkle. He says, uh, you can experience this filling by simply remaining open to the work of God in your life. Only the Spirit can make your joy full, but you can stay open to this filling by creating conditions in your life that are best used by the Spirit. It's not by talking to yourself, be joyous, be joyous, be joyous. It's by being open to the Lord is at hand. It's being open to, man, God, I gotta be open in my life to the work of God in my life at all. The best personal example I know of this is... Um, the pastor that was the senior pastor of the church that we planted, Village Church, out of, his name is Paul Johnson. He, you know, there's people in your life you just meet and you're like, my gosh, why is it that you go through such difficulty in your life? He, his wife was diagnosed with breast cancer years ago. She passed away. Um, he had uh, three kids and they moved here. He got remarried. They moved here. They were pastoring and his oldest son, 20, 22 years old, was a uh, 
they'd been here for five or six years at the time, and he was staying at a, at a house in Langley, and he got up one day, and he looked out the window. He heard some shuffling around, 2 o'clock in the morning. He looks out the window, and a guy looks up at him, and he just shoots him. And he dies. And I'm looking at Paul Johnson, and he's looking, and he's going, you know what? God is still good. And I'm like, how? How? How is that possible? Because he, Paul has this mentality, and this is what's key. This is what Paul's trying to say in Ephesians 4. You can rejoice in the Lord always because the Lord is at hand, meaning if you have an eternal perspective, then the joy floods in, even in the midst of suffering, because you know even when your 86 years is done, the delight just intensified by a million because you're face to face with joy himself. You're now in the presence of God. This is why Thomas Vincent uh, in like the 1500s wrote this book on loving Christ and on his deathbed, he was like, man, the doctor kept coming and trying to help him and save his life. And Thomas Vincent's like, stay away. I don't want you anymore. Why do you keep slowing down the chariots of Jesus? They're trying to usher me into heaven. Leave me alone, doctor, right? And it was like this sense of like, man, I know what's next for me now. And it doesn't take my joy, actually. That's what's crazy about all this. I know in worldly perspective, this is all insane. And that's the point. Because if there is no God and there is no eternity, then you're right, bro. Like, just make as much money as you can. Step on every throat on the way, because this is all you have. This is your one moment to shine. You got 86 years. Get the most pleasure out of it and done. But we all know that that can't be the answer because even when you do that, you're never satisfied. You're never fulfilled. So how do we get this joy? Matthew chapter five puts it this way. This is crazy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. What do you mean? I thought the way to find happiness and satisfaction was to go after happiness and satisfaction. Eh. Listen to me, joy is a result of going after something else. Namely, what he says is righteousness. You go after God himself, you go after righteousness and joy and satisfaction is actually the result of that. That's the eternal perspective. Ed Clowney, who's this uh, New Testament professor, great theologian, writes a bunch of books on the New Testament. He preached a sermon years ago where he pointed out, I love this, in John chapter two, where Jesus is sitting at the wedding and everyone's you know, having a great time and they say, hey, Jesus, can you turn this water, you know, do something about this? And he ends up turning the water into wine. But his first comment is, uh, it's not my time yet. What he means by that is I'm gonna go to the cross. And so he's sitting at a wedding and Ed Clowney points out when everyone's sitting having joy, Jesus is sad. He's reflecting on the cross. He's reflecting on the suffering that he's gonna go through. And everyone around him has no clue what he's about to do and what he's gonna suffer in life. He knows, they don't. They're all clinking glasses. They're all having fun. And then Clowney says this. Jesus, listen to this. This is the hope for you. This is about you, what I'm about to say. He says this. Jesus sits in the midst of all that joy, sipping the coming sorrow so that you can sit in the midst of all the world's sorrow and sip the coming joy. When you know where it's all going, that there is heaven to be had even when we pass away, then you can sit in the midst of the sorrows of your own life and still sip joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. There's ways that Satan tries to steal your joy, Paul Johnson told me, after losing a wife and losing a kid. There's ways that Satan tries to steal your joy and the only way through is to have the eternal perspective. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way. If I have not awakened, he, he, he said this during World War II, if I have not awakened to the fact that my soul 
and my relationship to God are infinitely more important than the possibility that my body may be destroyed by a nuclear bomb, then I have not started to be a Christian. That's the kind of perspective. So what are the things that steal your joy? I think circumstances can take it, but you root yourself in Jesus. Um, Myths that you start to believe in your mind can steal your joy. You ever had that in your life where you're like, I know this person's talking about me. I guarantee these people are talking about me. And you start to do this narrative in your brain and and then you come to find out later like that's never happened. But you had a myth in your brain? There's all kinds of myths going on right now. Everybody has myths and stories in their brains right now. And, And what psychologists and sociologists actually call the myth of pure evil is a very prominent myth right now, which basically there's an us and there's a them in society and culture And there's a myth of pure evil where those people are purely evil and it's taking your joy. So what it leads to is is a naivety about reality. You create these huge, so so for instance, all anti-vaxxers are dumb and evil. All government officials are dumb and evil. You see those narratives? They're naive. They are not nuanced enough because life is far more complicated than these massive categories that we create. And we say, it's me versus them. I'm good, you're evil, I know what's right, you don't, you're out to get so and so. And we create these narratives in our brain and it's completely naive because that's not the way life works. There's shade, but when we create life to say those things, think about 9-11, just happened a couple of weeks ago. One writer talks about 9-11 and the myth of pure evil and he says, Islamic extremists wanted to kill Americans because they're using the myth of pure evil to interpret Arab history and current events. They see America as the great Satan a villain so evil that there is no good. They're distorted by the myth of pure evil. That's what we do. And we do it when we look at other people and it takes our joy. Let me encourage you to understand. Life is far more complicated than the black and white categories we create. And some of you, your souls have shriveled over the last 18 months because you've bought in to these categories of evil on both sides of the political ideological discussion. And it's stealing your joy. I sit with people and I'm trying to work with their real problems, like real life marriage. And I'm sitting with them, okay, we gotta work with this and we gotta figure out your love languages and you guys are fighting a lot. And they're like, yeah, but Trump. I'm like, what the heck? (laughs) You ain't gonna solve Trump, man. You gotta figure out your marriage. What the heck is going on? And we lose priority and it takes our joy. One of the great distinctives throughout all history for Christians has not been about being right about everything. It's about people defined by joy. Inner peace in your life, inner joy, inner satisfaction, inner fulfillment is not gonna come by meditating and talking yourself into stuff and denying reality and entering yourself, it's by coming to understand something very important. See, uh, here's what I think we've missed. Tony Robbins comes into town and he gets you all pumped up and he gets you pumped up about you. You're a winner! And everyone pays 20 grand to show up to become successful in life. You're a winner. You should win. You tell yourself you should win. Yes, I can win. I'm a winner. And the reality is, guys... You're losers. Like, hate to tell you, but the Bible disagrees with Tony Robbins. The Bible says we're all a bunch of losers. We are sinful from the core, cannot save ourselves, cannot get to heaven when we die by being a good person and trying really hard and positive thinking our way out of our problems. That is not the way. Listen, uh, look, uh, this week I went golfing with some friends. 
And we got to like the 12 or 13th hole and I heard my buddy whispering over in the bush and I said, what's going on there? He said, well, I think you, you picked up, uh, the, you hit the wrong ball. And I'm like, yeah, I did hit the wrong ball. I didn't realize it was my ball. I hit it and then I went and I found my ball. He's like, yeah, that's a two stroke penalty. I'm like, yeah, it's a two stroke penalty if we're on the PGA Tour, bro. We're all a bunch of 15 handicaps. No one plays by that rule in the history of time. He's like, you know what, I'm sick of you. And I said, I'm sick of you. And we started fighting on the golf course and he left the golf course. 12th hole, I was like, dude, we're not even done yet. And he leaves. And the other two guys were with are like, oh gosh, so they just kept walking. And I get home and my family's like, how'd it go? I'm like, well, me and this guy fought on the golf course. And my kids are looking at me. And it's at that point that I realized how ridiculous this is. When my 10 year old's blinking, trying to rashly make sense of the story. Yeah, but, but he said he hit my ball. I didn't mean to hit the ball. He had a two stroke penalty of 15 handicaps. And they're like, so what happened? I'm like, he left. He left. You're 40 year old men screaming at each other on a golf course. Dad, you're a loser. <laughs> and I call him the next day and we're apologize. I'm sorry, man. I was in a mood. I'm sorry too, bro. I love you, bro. What a loser. I am a loser, man. And so are you. And the more you keep trusting in yourself, the more you're going to disappoint yourself and the more you're going to get crushed under the weight and you will never experience joy because the one thing I can guarantee is the common denominator in your life that steals joy is you. Which is why we call Jesus the Savior, not you. He saves you not only from sin, not only from Satan, he saves you from yourself. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray for those of us driven, as all of us are, to experience pleasure, joy, delight forevermore, that we would realize that that is only found in you, the one who suffered on our behalf, who shed his blood for our sin, who rose again for our salvation to save us from the silliness of what we try to go after to give us happiness. And that it's only found in you. And that if we run after you, the joy is to follow. Not as a reward, but as the natural outflow of finding the source of joy and happiness, you. So let that define our life in the midst of great circumstances and awful ones. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen. <laughs>